share the screen. Okay, so um, I'll say I'll just say a little bit about these refuges um, and precepts. Um, so, uh, so I, I'd like to start before I even begin that. Um, let's uh, begin by honoring um, the earth, Mother Earth, uh, where we find ourselves sitting on this earth. Um, this, uh, this wooden floor is uh, an earth element and is connected to the earth. We're situated in this place uh, at this time. And uh, the, the earth is our mother and uh, all of our life uh, comes from the earth and uh, and all the elements that we find in the natural world. Our body arises and is nourished by them. And um, and as we appreciate and bring gratitude and respect for the earth and our life and our bond. Um, as children of the earth with our mother, we also need to honor and give gratitude and respect for our ancestors in this place, the indigenous peoples of this place here in Montreal, Chichaga, um, the Kanyakahaga, people uh, and other indigenous people lived in and, uh, and, and lived in interdependence uh, with the earth and all of the elements. Um, we, can, we can learn from and reconnect with the wisdom of these traditions that, um, that the indigenous people here and around the world lived from, knowing our interdependence with all of the elements of the earth. Um, we've, we've fallen into, um, especially uh, in the last 500 years or more um, of uh, a, a kind of a solo self, individualized self um, attitude where we somehow uh, deny or choose to forget how our life is interconnected um, with all life. And so let's, let's remember and honor our ancestors and also honor our spiritual ancestors, uh, the, the lineage of Buddhism, the, the uh, practice, those practitioners, monastic and non-monastic who have carried forth these teachings to us uh, for so many centuries, uh, millennia. And that we now are in this position of being ancestors. We are the ancestors who are carrying these teachings forth in our own lives, in our own practice. And, uh, and we are the, the ones who are discovering and living out of our interconnectedness with all of life. And so this is as, uh, as Leila uh, Saad writes in her book, um, Me and White Supremacy, it's our responsibility 
to become a good ancestor. That we, that we want to become a good ancestor in how we, how we live and the values that we cultivate. So uh, in terms of um, refuges, the refuges, these are a really central foundational part of the Buddhist teachings. Um, and, and going for refuge in the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha, is something that we do, we can do every day, we can do at any moment when we feel that we are, um, you know, the, the word refuge is, I think, so uh, powerful and evocative that when do we seek refuge? When we're in a storm, when we're lost, when we are, um, feel that we're in, in need on shaky ground. Uh, and, and so it's, it's so beautiful to seek refuge. And then as we grow in understanding these refuges, we, in a way, these refuges live inside us and we find them within us and we can, we can uh, become our own refuge in the sense that we, that we understand how Buddha, Dharma and Sangha are alive within our own being. So, so as we go for refuge, um, we can just reflect on that uh, of how we, um, how we can find refuge, how we can seek refuge, how we can live from a sense, an embodied sense of being a refuge, as the Buddha said, be a lamp unto yourself, be a, um, oh, some people are arriving, being a, a lamp unto yourself, being a, uh, a refuge unto yourself. So we can, we can, um, We can remember that. We can remember in the sense of bring, remember has to do with to embody again. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm, some people just uh, came, arrived. So welcome to those who are just arriving uh, and uh, just a little distracted. Um, so just talking about the refuges, uh, what they mean. And, uh, and we also are, or can be a refuge to others. Like it's, um, especially in the dimension of Sangha that we can bring this sense of being refuge to, um, to all those who are on the path. Uh, we can encourage we can embody um, mindfulness and kindness. And, um, and we're all on the path. So there's nobody who's not on the path. <laughs> we're all on the path, um, whether, whether we know it or not. We're all on a path to to becoming our best self. So if you're not familiar with these chants, uh, feel free to, to um, just listen. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you are, uh, are familiar with them, then, um, then please feel free to, to chant along or read the English. Um, Namo tasa bhagavato arahanto samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa 
Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Udang saranang gachami tamang saranang gachami sangam saranang gachami dutiyam hi budang saranang gachami Dutiyam hi damang saranang gachami. Dutiyam hi sangang saranang gachami. Tatiyam hi budang saranang gachami. Tatiyam hi damang saranang gachami. Tatiyam hi sangang saranang gachami. So taking the five precepts, um, these are also foundational teachings uh, in Buddhism, they are, the, and they are not only foundation, but they, they, we carry them with us through every uh, development of practice as our practice evolves. They become uh, deeper and deeper. They're an integral part of how we live our practice and they're an integral part of how we embody Sangha, uh, the practice community, that we create a sense of, of non-harming, of a safe space, a, uh, a, a, a welcoming attitude that here we respect uh, our one another's need to, to live uh, with, a sense of safety and freedom from being harmed, harmed by um, violence, harmed by taking what's not freely offered, harmed by uh, inappropriate sexual conduct or, or lying, or unkind speech and so on. Um, behaviors coming out of addiction. So these are the expression of the um, precepts. Panati pata veramani sikapadam samadhyami Adina dana veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Kame sumitatara veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Musawada veramani sikapadam Samadhyami. Sora Maria Maja Pamadatana Veramani Sikapadam Samadhyami. Idami Sila Maga Falanyana Sapachayo Hotu. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.
So, um, so I know uh, not everybody has been um, following our theme uh, since the fall, since September, we began um, uh, focusing on the Satipatthana Sutta, the, the four establishments of mindfulness. And, uh, and so we've, um, these, these four establishments are um, mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of um, mental states. And now we're in the fourth, mindfulness of dhammas. Uh, sometimes it's translated as objects of mind or phenomena. Uh, often we don't translate the word dhammas because it's, it doesn't, well, like it's one of these uh, Pali words that doesn't really have a great translation. It has a very wide meaning. But um, and we, can, we can perhaps understand dhammas as just being phenomena that we take in with the mind, that we experience in the mind. Um, so... So we, we looked at hindrances, we looked at, um, uh, in, so this chapter on dhammas has several sections and now we are on uh, what's called the five khandhas or the five aggregates. And, um, and the Buddha usually went in the, in the text when, um, when he uses this phrase, the five aggregates, he uses, he adds on the five aggregates of clinging. So, so what are these five aggregates? They are the components, the aggregates is a, uh, one translation of the word khandas, another is heaps, you know, like heaps of stuff uh, that we're composed of. So these five aggregates are what is, it, what is a sentient being composed of? Um, and so the way that the Buddha taught, uh, it, it, because it's an oral tradition, um, many different kind of lists, many different ways of grouping uh, the, uh, our, uh, how we can understand the, dhar the Dharma. And, um, and so, so the Buddha said, you know, we can, when we, when we look at, the, at, at ourselves, when we consider ourselves, what are we, who, who are we, what are we composed of, we generally think of five things. Um, and so the first of these is the body. We think of ourselves as, as a body. Uh, and, and so, so we, when, we, when I say we think of ourselves, we construct a sense of self around being a body or having a body. So, um, and, the, and this is the first of the, of the five khandhas and the others are um, feelings. Um, so feelings being uh, the sensations that arise in our experience, including the component of that they are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, neither pleasant or unpleasant. And, um, and so we spent quite a, a long time reflecting on that and talking about that together. And, um, and, then, and then the third is perceptions. So perceptions, we're gonna talk about that in the future, but um, in, in the next couple of weeks, but um, but these perceptions have to do with um, how we how um, we take information in through our senses, through seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and touching, and the mind, um, and how we uh, name them and understand what they are as something separate. So perception is something that develops over the course of our lives. Um, like a newborn baby uh, doesn't have the same kind of perceptions that 
we have as we as we grow up and we and it, and it's very connected to language that, that the way that we name things so we're going to talk about perception and then and then the, the fourth are mental formations and the one that's particularly focused on usually so mental formations are our thoughts our 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 emotions our um, our beliefs, our values, uh, and so on. There's overlap in these different uh, categories. And, um, and so mental formations, uh, the one that's focused on is volition usually, because we, we create a lot of a sense of ourself out of what, what do we want? What do we will? And we identify with what we will ourselves to do. So, so it's not to say that these are always bad, but it's just to understand what they are. And that when we identify as these as me or mine, then it creates clinging and it creates suffering. So, so, so remember these, these categories are all about becoming free of suffering. It's not that we're supposed to necessarily stop doing these things. Um, it's looking at how do we, you know, what are our beliefs? What are, how do we understand these experiences? And then the fifth one is consciousness. So, so just to name them again, form, feelings, perception, um, volition. We're gonna focus on volition and consciousness. Um, so, um, so these are the five khandas or the five aggregates or the five heaps that we cling to, um, that we think uh, or believe is me or mine. And the Buddha said, and, and this, is, this is interesting in, in one of the discourses on, in which he discusses the uh, khandas, the Buddha says, one assumes the body to be the self. So we assume the body is the self. Uh, or we assume that the self is in possession of a body. So it's a little different, right? So the first, the first one is, I am my body. And the second one might be, I have a body. So we use both of those to talk about our attitudes to the body. Or sometimes we think that the body is in the self. So some sense of the self, which is bigger, but that the body is somehow in it as part of a self. And, uh, or that we think that the self resides in the body. So those are four different things. I am a body, I have a body, uh, body is somewhere kind of in myself, whatever that is, and or this, or the self is in the body. So all of this, the intention of all of this is to um, loosen and, and liberate our clinging to how we construct a sense of self and, um, and focus on that, uh, that self um, as who and what we are. Uh, so earlier on, um, and, and now we're gonna really focus on the body um, and, and, and you might recall, uh, if you participated in, in the earlier discussions early in the fall, uh, when we started studying the Satipatthana Sutta, that we, um, we put a lot of attention on the body, right? That's the first chapter. So there were meditations on the body and contemplations of the body. So learning to just, um, kind of bring our mindfulness in the body as a body and just 
being mindful of this flow of sensation in the body um, and, and recognizing that this body is something that is in flux all the time, that our experience of being a body, being embodied is, is something that's changing moment to moment to moment all the time. So, you know, sometimes it's pleasant, sometimes it's unpleasant, sometimes it's neither. You know, uh, the body gets sick, things break down, uh, and, and, you know, we're surprised. <laughs> and uh, we think that this shouldn't be happening, that the body shouldn't be getting sick. What's wrong with me? Why is my body getting sick? And the Buddha said, it's of the nature of the body to, to age, to become ill, and to die. And so, um, so this is when we really take this in, um, we are cultivating a capacity to be embodied to, to live, experience our life unfolding in this body, through this body, in a way that is open, accepting, sensitive, and more free of clinging. So it's a process that we, you know, we um, you may remember that we spent a long time reflecting on death and dying uh, and the decomposition of the body. That's one of the contemplations in, uh, the, in the first chapter of the Satipatthana Sutta. The Buddha, one of the uh, metaphors or analogies that's used often in talking about the first of the khandas is um, a, a lump of foam on uh, kind of floating on a river or floating in the sea. So, so the Buddha said, you know, when you see this lump of foam from a distance, um, it looks like it's substantial. It looks like it's, you know, it's something. Uh, but when you look at it more closely, you realize that it's, it's just bubbles. It's just held together in the most uh, ephemeral way. Uh, and it, you know, anything, you know, floating piece of wood or stick on the river could just break it up and it, you know, it just, you know, scatter into different pieces. So, so it, we, this, this, this sense of the body is like a lump of, of foam, um, you know, is something to, to keep in mind. It, and it's similar to the contemplation of the parts of the body, isn't it, in the, in the first chapter, that, you know, that the body is, you know, skin and hair and teeth and bone and eyeballs and, and mucus and you know blood and all of these things when we you know kind of uh, not decompose uh, yeah there's a word I'm looking for uh, take apart um, in mentally deconstruct when we mentally deconstruct the body you know we recognize that it's uh, yeah it's a system it's a system it's an open system. It's a system in which we need to take in water. Uh, we need to take in air. We breathe in, we breathe out, we, we drink water, and then we excrete water through urinating, through the um, perspiration uh, of, our, of our bodies and so on. Um, we take in food, we excrete food, we excrete the waste. So we are not a I mean, we are a system. It's not to say the Buddha never said that we don't exist. You know, sometimes people mistake 
this idea of um, the Buddha's teaching on non-self to say that that we don't exist. It's you know how what is this existence, and um, you know and and that if we cling to it as something permanent, something separate, something that exists somehow as a solo self, as an independent self, we. We are intradependent. We are interconnected. Um, intra-connected, as um, Dan Siegel talks about in his book, uh, which I'm reading now, Intraconnection. It's a very interesting book. So, um, So, so th this, this exploration that we're doing of the body in terms of one of the, um, the khandas or aggregates, just um, realizing I forgot to have my little clock, which helps me stay. Even a reasonable time frame. Um, this, uh, the way that we're looking at it is a little bit different from the first chapter. So, you know, you might ask, well, we already covered the body in the first chapter of the Satipatthana. Why are we going back over it? Um, so, so uh, first of all, I want to say that, you know, for any of you who are using this book, um, that I recommended at the beginning, uh, Satipatthana Meditation, by uh, a practice guide by Bhikkhu Analyo. Um, he doesn't actually repeat um, the, the exploration of the body in the form of the khandas. In his practice guide uh, of the Satipatthana, he emphasizes just two of the um, mind objects or dhammas that are are named uh, in in that chapter, the fourth chapter, uh, the five hindrances and the seven factors of awakening, because he thinks that those are actually the essence of what's in that last chapter, and he suspects that maybe the other elements that are in that fourth chapter have were added later. So he thinks that it's likely that the Buddha, and he and he comes to this conclusion through uh, studying many different texts and translations and so on, and and how the texts were uh, transmitted into the Mahayana and the Tibetan traditions. So um, so that's a scholarly explanation. Um, but um, but I would say my understanding of you know how we can approach the the body and the other four khandas as as we do it in in this perspective from the fourth chapter is is from what are our attitudes and our beliefs how do we hold our our sense of what is the body as a mind object whereas in the first part in the first chapter of the satipatthana uh, we were really looking at our direct experience of the body, really turning the attention to, you know, how does the body move? How do we, you know, experience in this moment the body standing, walking, um, sitting, touching, uh, eating, urinating, defecating, all of these things are listed in the sutta. Be mindful of every activity of the body. So I think that that is the focus of the first chapter, like just to bring mindfulness into the body and really practice living mindfully in this embodied way. And, and when we reflect on the khandas, it's, it's how, how do we how do we hold 
this, these attitudes, looking at the attitudes themselves in our daily practice. So, so you know, one attitude could be, and this is, I think, it pretty common, that we, we bring an attitude to our body of how is my body being perceived? That we, we feel uh, insecure, perhaps, about our bodies. And, um, and we, we want our bodies to uh, be approved of. I mean, this is, I know it's something that's uh, has, you know, at least in my generation, and I, I, I suspect it likely continues, um, for women, and it may very well be true for uh, many men that there's this attitude of that this body is somehow how I appear in the world, and and it needs to be okay. It needs to be of a shape, of a size, and you know, of course, as we consider ourselves to be embodied. We are aware of, you know, racial attitudes, um, attitudes towards uh, being differently abled, different different ways that the body is, um, you know, is shaped, is is formed. Uh, so attitudes towards, you know, is it is it too small? Is it too big? You know, all of these judgments that that we internalize around the body and and certainly when we internalize these attitudes to the body and and they become added you know feelings of anxiety and you know that uh and you know and judgment and and uh and and desire you know desire to be pleasing desire to be to be desired, you know, all of these patterns around the body, you know, those are very, uh, there's a lot of clinging there. <laughs> there's a lot of clinging and there's a lot of suffering there. So, um, you know, and the natural aging of the body, you know, how many creams and how many, you know, like $75 for a little tiny bottle of this cream that's supposed to keep your skin looking young, you know, all of these things that there's so much clinging. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, do we, do we feel disappointed in the body when it gets sick? Do we feel somehow that we did something wrong? What, you know, what did I do? Uh, I mean, you know, my mind does that. It's like, uh, I, those of you who uh, have been here are aware that I had hip surgery and uh, I have hip replacement surgery in January. And, and, you know, that was a lot of what I felt as, you know, over the course of, the, you know, couple of years as the the osteoarthritis got worse and worse and there was more pain it was like what did I do wrong and you know how did this happen like and it's like oh, the body breaks down you know and it happens differently for different people and um I don't know why my sister doesn't have osteoarthritis and I got it but um but there you go uh and and so, um, so, so we can blame ourselves. We can somehow think that there's something wrong. That you know, we can we can feel uh, angry at the body or angry at life. You know, all of these things. So, so the practice is like, how is the mind? engaging with the experience of the body. What are our values? What are our beliefs? What are our attitudes toward the body? And this is the exploration that we do as we engage with, um, with these 
uh, with these discourses, uh, with these teachings on the aggregates. So, um, yeah. So, so I'd like to move into uh, practice, and then after practice, we'll have some time to maybe talk about if you have questions. So, but I, I think it's good to uh, not just ask the questions. If possible, conceptual questions are fine, but also to uh, to have an experience of okay. So if if pain arises in meditation, um, so to understand, well, this is unpleasant. This is an embodied experience, and what co arises, you know. So there's a sensation and co-arising with it, perhaps is pain, uh, and is there at the same time an attitude that says this is wrong or this shouldn't be happening or you know I've got to get rid of this, you know, like what are really becoming intimate, getting curious. So it's not that you know, and always um, I think it it can be repeated, it can never be repeated too many times. Practice is really about being curious and, and knowing, becoming mindful of what is coming up in the body mind. Not that, you know, something is wrong and has to be corrected. Um, yes, there is a discernment that some attitudes toward the body in this case um, are coming from clinging and lead to suffering. And so, so we can discern that. And that enables us to stop clinging to those attitudes, but it's not that we have to make, that somehow we're wrong. So, so because when we judge ourselves for having these attitudes of, you know, I'm not good enough, or I don't, whatever it is, you know, that just piles more suffering on top of suffering, right? So that's, that's not, that's not the way, that's not the path. The path is to be mindful, become mindful. And there's a, a letting go that arises uh, naturally as we discern how this creates suffering. So, so um, yeah, so let's sit. Um, so take Please take a moment if you want to stand up and just uh, release your posture. Um, we're going to sit for 30 minutes. So um, feel free to release. As we begin our, our sitting practice, bring uh, attention to the body, to the feeling, the sensation of the body in contact with the earth, to the comportment, the posture of the body, shape of the body as it is sitting or standing or lying down.
Feel the body breathing. However you experience that, in the nostrils, in the chest, in the belly. And let the, the breath, the experience, the, the knowing of the breath, be a way of collecting, gathering your attention into the body, moment by moment, breath by breath. We can bring, as we begin our, our practice, our body practice, we can bring an attitude of gratitude, appreciation for this body. This body is essential for our life, for our practice. And so welcoming, can we welcome this body into this moment with mindfulness and kindness? Welcome the whole body. We may notice assumptions about the body. So assumptions is another way of saying attitudes of clinging or self-construction. We may have an underlying assumption of this body is me. This body is mine. I am my body, I have a body. So if we loosen our assumptions, just see them as ways that we mentally hold, cling to this body, What happens to our attitude? What happens to the way that we relate to this body? Can it simply be there is a body? There is a body, this body.
Can it simply be a moment by moment emergence of bodying, of being? Being in the body, through the body. Resting. So let's explore this, this body as a phenomena and relating to it with less clinging, less assumptions, less expectations, less judgment.
as we bring more mindfulness and awareness to our attitudes toward the body and how we cling to the body and clinging includes uh, rejection, aversion, as well as desire. We may touch into the suffering connected to those attitudes. And so part of this practice, a very essential part of this practice, right at the heart of it is to have a compassionate attitude toward our, the ways that we are entangled, the knots that we tie ourselves up in, as well as to the body itself. Bringing compassion to the body, the body is conditioned, the body is interdependent, the body is, um, can be the, the site, the context of suffering, as well as pleasure. And so remembering compassion. The Buddha's attitude toward the body, toward suffering, was one of compassion. And so as we take refuge in teachings, in the Buddha, in the practice community, we, we need to remember compassion.
as we uh, reach the end of our formal sitting, formal practice, we can reflect on the goodness, the blessings of this practice, the moments of clarity, of release, of the mind and body becoming more calm, of the arising of compassion or insight. These are all blessings and, and also the, the commitment, the energy that we've brought to our practice, the willingness to begin again, to reconnect with the breath, with the body, to bring mindfulness to our experience again and again. This is also a blessing. And these blessings have a kind of quality that is called merit in the Buddhist tradition. And we can share this merit. This merit nourishes ourselves, our practice. We can also share it with the life around us. And so I invite you to bring to mind those who you know who are perhaps struggling or suffering in some way or those that you don't know. Anyone to whom or any beings or any place, any part of the earth, that you would like to share this merit. To offer it for release, for, for the freedom from suffering, for joy, for healing, for thriving. May the blessings, the goodness of our practice and of our lives serve and support the happiness, well being, and liberation of all beings. Thank you for that question. So the question is around um, with hearing loss uh, and, um, and it's hearing loss at a level that makes it difficult to have ordinary communications, hear what people are saying. Uh, sometimes there's uh, some sense of feeling stigmatized um, or less than, and feelings of anger at the body, sense of betrayal or loss, just a loss of of the um, the ease of just having a conversation. So I, that you know that is that is real and. Um, uh, and and it is uh, there is a loss there is a loss that um, and there are real conditions that are that create some challenge 
you know, around the hearing loss in terms of relating and so on. It's so the invitation in this teaching is to look at the suffering around the loss, around the hearing loss, to look at, so you named very clearly, you know, a, a kind of a grief. So there's, it's not just the loss, but there's a grief and the grief, and again, please know that these are not judging words, but the grief is connected to clinging, like to wanting it to be other than what it is right now. So the grief is, I, I don't want this hearing loss to be here. And the hearing loss is present. And, you know, I assume that you are addressing it with, you know, hearing aids or whatever it can be applied medically to ameliorate the loss. And I know that sometimes um, the, law, the hearing loss can be uh, such that it's not easily um, addressed. Uh, and so it continues to be problematic. So, so there's grief, there's stigma, there's anger, betrayal. Um, all of these are, are ways that the mind holds the reality of this hearing loss. And so we can turn toward the experience of grief. We can turn toward the experience of anger. We can turn toward the experience of betrayal. And, and just take courageously a, a stance in which we investigate what is this attitude that the mind is holding, you know, of betrayal. So, so say, you know, um, it's anger, it's, it's, you know, what, what, how can we, how can we engage with this in a way that is really honest and compassionate and onward leading and not stuck because if we're stuck in it's this is not the way it's supposed to be you know the it shouldn't be like this this hearing loss it's not fair why is this happening to me you know we're it's going to be an obstacle to our living in peace and to living with more ease and well-being with the limitations of the body. So, you know, so the, the Buddha, it's, it's this teaching of the second arrow. You know, the Buddha says life you know, brings pain. Uh, the body breaks down, the body ages, the body uh, experiences pain. And, and then we, so we're, life shoots arrows at us, and then we shoot ourselves also with, this, with another arrow, which is self-blame, anger, betrayal, uh, denial that things are the way they are. So there's an invitation to, to recognize that this is the way, this is the way it is. And, and can I find, can I not, not to judge my reactivity, but to, to release my reactivity by, by becoming intimate with it and recognizing 
that it is creating a deeper and deeper suffering. So let me